Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. As part of the University of Wolverhampton's Black History Month programme, we are continuing to bring you some fantastic talks this week. For the next hour, we will be joining social commentator, campaigner and cultural historian, Dr. Patrick Vernon, who will be discussing his book, 100 Greatest Black Britons. Your host will be Will Cooling, Head of Equality and Diversity here at the University. If you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. Welcome both. Over to you, Will. Uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you for joining us again, Patrick. It's a great pleasure to have Patrick here. We've had him to speak at the University a fair few times, most recently for Winbush Day. And obviously last year, we're extremely honoured to give him an honorary doctorate for all his work in the field of race equality. So I pass over to Patrick to talk about this, uh, this, this excellent new book, which by the way, we have got copies of in the University Library. So anybody who after hearing Patrick would like to borrow it from the University Library, just you know, get in touch with them and they can, they can, they can share that with you. But uh, um, obviously this obviously was all started almost two decades ago with the 100 Greatest Britons uh, series of programmes that the BBC did, um, which was an extremely white, a series of programs didn't properly celebrate the contribution that black and other ethnic minority Britons had made through these centuries. Obviously, although we often think of Windrush as the start of modern day multiracial Britain, actually Britain has, has never been a fully entirely white society. So I was trying to explain this concept of 100 Greatest Black Britons to a student about a month ago. And I was saying, oh, it's like that BBC campaign, you know, the one that happened in 2002. And I just saw this blank look on her face as I realised that she'd have probably been about two um, when those series of programmes actually aired. But it's an enduring message, this, this need to actually celebrate the contribution that Black Britons have made. And I'm delighted that Patrick and his co-author uh, Dr. Osborne had been able to uh, revise the book to highlight other examples, more contemporary examples that reflect the diversity of the Black community. And I hope you all join me in welcoming Patrick to uh, begin by having a talk to us about the book and the ideas behind this and the original campaign. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Okay, fine. And thanks so much, uh, Will and everyone online. It's a really great honour to um, to do, do this talk for Black History Month and, and also be part of the Wolverhampton University family, especially when I got my honorary degree a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, if you look, look behind, you can see the picture of my, me and my parents at the graduation there. So it's pride and joy of my, of my uh, mantelpiece. So what I'm going to do is just talk a bit about the campaign, why I did it, um, uh, the book about the book itself, and then have a conversation. And uh, if people want to ask any questions, that, that's fine as well. I mean, normally I do so sort of like PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that, but I thought it would be quite good just to have a, uh, have a conversation with you all uh, as well. And um, so, as Will said, um, it's about nearly eight, what, 18 years ago now when the BBC did their campaign. And the reason why I think it's interesting um, on, on, on reflection, because in, in, in the year 2000, um, Britain was going through an identity, identity crisis, and Britain historically has always gone through an identity of crisis, part of Britishness, uh, and and at the time there was a real big move, as you know, for um, uh, Scottish devolution, as you know, um, Scotland virtually runs itself more or less. Um, and um, so, but that 20 years ago, there was a massive campaign for devolution. There's similar the moves in Wales uh, for devolution, and also at the same time, there's a massive debate. Um, if some of you can remember this, about having more power in terms of regional government uh, as well at the same time. Um, and whilst in, the, in that context, there was the ongoing uh, kind of uh, general election campaigns from 1960s, uh, for that infamous campaign run by that Conservative MP. So, if, you know, uh, Martin said the word, if, if both Labour um, um, if, and, you have an, an, and you have an end person. And so there've always been a toxic race and, and discrimination, race and immigration has always been a feature of all general elections since the 1950s and 60s, to be quite honest, and there was no difference in the 2000s. Um, so the BBC had this fantastic idea to say, how can we bring the country together again? You know, you know, the, the unions is not separate, um, and they thought by having a massive TV campaign, 
engaging with the public about trying to find their greatest Britain of all time, that would somehow magically bring the country back together again. By going to the annals of British history, we'll find this mystical person that will unite the country. That was, I think that was their vision. Um, and I know this because when I, when I launched my campaign, I had a meeting with the BBC because they were thinking about making a TV programme based on the website, but I'll come to that a bit later. Um, so the public, the BBC spent loads of our taxpayers' money, millions of pounds, in having um, a massive uh, uh, advertising campaign, billboard, billboard posters around, around the country, uh, as well as their platforms, to try and get elicit from the public the greatest Britain of all time. Um, they eventually finalised it to 100. I don't think I remember the programmes, and then from the 100, they reduced down to 10, and then for the final winner. And that, when, I did the, when I did the 100, um, there was no black people featured in that, in that 100 list. And the only ethnic person or only personal colour, basically, was Freddie Mercury, lead singer of the band Queen, uh, born of Farsi parents, uh, born in Zanzibar in East Africa. But I suppose if you looked at Freddie Mercury, you wouldn't think he was of Asian or South East, uh, Asian or Persian background, um, to be quite honest. So, but actually at the time, a lot of people complained about the campaign. The Welsh complained, there weren't enough Welsh people. The Irish complained, there weren't enough Irish people. And Scottish people complained, there weren't enough Scottish people. Feminists complained, said there weren't enough women. And Black and Asian people complained. So I, was, I remember I was in this kind of gist mail, which I'm still on, BASA, Black and Asian Society. And, I, and, I put, and everyone was sharing the experience, so here we go again. The BBC had a fantastic opportunity to reflect the diversity, multicultural Britain, but they missed a the trick again. And people were sort of complaining and whinging and stuff like that. So I replied, well, let's do a counter campaign. Let's do something to demonstrate all of us, you know, on this, on this just mail. We all, we all know a lot about Black British history. Let's work together and do something. And people were interested. And I remember one person saying, Patrick, if you do it, good luck to you. Thanks, thanks guys for the solidarity. Um, so I decided I was going to do it anyway, and um, and I pulled together a team uh, of, of web designers, about two or three web designers, and a researcher. Uh, and actually, the researcher that did it uh, did the work was her name was Angelina. She just completed her masters in history, and she's a, and 17 years later, and she's a good friend of mine, and she's my co-author as well. So which is really great um, that we've worked together all these years uh, as well. And we pulled together, I pulled together a team of black creatives to launch um, a brand new website, a brand to create a website. I'd already had a website already called Every Generation, uh, celebrating family genealogy and heritage and stuff like that. And um, I thought it was important to do this uh, as an as intervention because, you know, there's been a black presence in Britain going back 2000 years, even longer. Um, we're British, this is our home, we ain't going nowhere. And that was and that was an important message. This is our home. And I know that people toy the idea and the winners generation, they had a five-year plan, 10-year plan of going back. But you know, there's about three generations of us here in Britain, and this is our home. For better, for worse, for us or not, this is our home. And um, so I thought that was important to make, to make that intervention at that time. And we pulled together a list of hundred design profiles. And luckily, um, I got support of the Mayor of London at the time, uh, Ken Livingstone, and his Deputy Mayor Lee Jasper. And we actually did the official launch of the website in City Hall, uh, 1st of October, 2003. And, um, and when we launched the website, within 24 hours, the website crashed. We had so many hits on that website. Actually, go on, let me step, step it back. Do you remember the, the good old days of, early days of the internet? days before Facebook, days before Twitter, Snapchat. I mean, for some people said, well, you know, people might, some of you might even think that's always been there in, in, all the time, but no, when in those old, in those days, around 2002s and 3s, this is the World Wide Web, where dial-up. Who can remember trying to get linked to your server, waiting to get a connection, desperately waiting for a connection, and then waiting, and getting, waiting for your emails and taking hours to get an attachment or a file. That's, that was the internet. There's no wireless, no nothing at all. It was all clunky. There weren't that many black, website, black history websites or black websites. There were about three, four at the time. 
around the 2000s as well. So it was a different era of, you know, social media and there's, you know, that didn't really exist at all. So, but I had a state of art website, which was really good at the time. And I've, I've got, I've still kept it, the original website deliberately because it's a, that is archived in its own record, in, in its own right as well. And, you know, um, British Library and other institutions are trying to cu uh, curate and preserve old websites because there's lots of historical information that's still useful and still uh, relevant as well. So um, did, launched a campaign, went absolutely ballistic, we had a serious amount of media coverage in all the national press. And it's almost like the first time that the media and the public started to have a conversation about Black Britishness, Black British identity, Black British history for the first time when we did a campaign. So it really struck, it really struck a chord um, then and, and now it's also in the book now. And um, Mary Seacole um, was voted the greatest Black Britain of all time. Actually, if you look at the timeline that we did in terms of the profiles, it, we had people like um, Septimus Severus, Black Roman Emperor, who was um, based in York uh, around about AD 200, the nearest person to a black prime minister that we'll ever probably have, who basically ran Britain, kept the Celts away uh, and, and rebuilt Adrian's War. Um, then we had you know, a whole range of historical figures up to, to the contemporaries like Miss Dynamite, because she was quite big then, if I remember Miss Dynamite. I'd have to start doing the songs right now, guys. Um, and we had a whole range of individuals featured on, in that campaign as well. Um, and I, announced, I actually announced the results live on Channel 4 News on February 2004, because there was so much media interest about the whole campaign, which I was taken aback. I thought personally, I thought it would, go, it would just go flat on its face and that would be it. But actually, you know, it, it touched the nerve, not in the black community, but in Britain, it really did. And when Mary Seacole was voted, great, voted greatest Black Britain, and, um, just to remind you, Winston Churchill, by the way, was voted the greatest Britain on the BBC website campaign. Uh, so, and it was really great to have Mary Seacole, you know, uh, as Great Black Britain. So a number of things happened as a result of her being voted the Great Black Britain. Firstly, um, the Royal College of Nursing, the professional body that represents nurses in Britain, and also trade union as well, um, adopted Mary Seacole uh, as on the same status and footing as Florence Nightingale. And this is quite important because what I'll talk a bit, this is relevant in terms of whole stuff around COVID-19, which I'll touch on later. And um, uh, so that was quite important that she was recognized by the nursing fraternity, you know. Um, secondly, a number of black nurses got together and they formed the Mary Seacole's Appeal Committee, started to raise money for a statue for Mary Seacole. And four years ago, that statue, statue was unveiled in the grounds of St. Thomas Hospital in central London, uh, statue of looking the Thames, straight, and Mary Seacole's looking straight at Parliament, basically. And thirdly, I think personally, more importantly, she was included for the first time in 2007 in the national curriculum, along with other black historical figures like uh, Equiano, Olo de Equiano, black abolitionists uh, as well. Um, and 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 you know and 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 actually more importantly that inspired more stuff from the I mean we've had this everyone you know we've got this debate right now haven't we about more black history in, in the curriculum, but that's the debate that happened when I was doing the campaign. It's actually a debate that was happening in the 80s when people camp when the national curriculum was first established by the Conservative government. People people like the Erica and Jessica Huntley were featured in the book were campaigning and writing to Kenneth Clark Kenneth Baker. Um, ed, the education secretary to have more black history. So there's been a long history of people campaigning for more black history in, in, the, in the curriculum as well. So I was part of that, that, that genealogy, if you want to argue that, when I did a campaign. F a few years later after the campaign, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Education, after no hissing, no, no boon at the moment, <laughs> um, decided that he wants to restructure the curriculum. Uh, it's weird. Can I ask you this question? Why there is an obsession with politicians to restructure the NHS and to restructure education? There seems to be an obsession around that. Um, anyway, Michael Gove wanted to get rid of suff suffragettes, uh, get rid of a number of other white historical figures, Mary Seacole, Equiano, uh, essentially. So uh, again, you know, uh, I got involved in, in a campaign. 
I work closely with Son Woolley, Director of Operation Black Belt, no, Lord Woolley, um, good friend, um, and uh, the Mary Seacole Appeals Committee. And we launched a change to all petition in uh, 2013, basically saying Mary Seacole should be kept in national curriculum because she's British, she's contributed to Britain, and she is also Great Black Britain. Um, we've got 40,000 signatures within about two weeks. Um, we had a letter in the Times, um, a letter was signed by MPs across all political parties. We had support of Jadavie Smith, a whole range of other celebrities. Um, to cut long story, long story short, Michael, Ke Michael Gove caved in and included, kept Mary Seacole in the curriculum. And the uh, moral to that story is don't touch a black woman, especially Mary Seacole, because she'll come and bite you. So I decided in 2019, um, it was time to relaunch the campaign uh, 17 years on. And there were a number of factors why I thought about it seriously. It's time to relaunch the campaign. As, as you know, I was heavily involved in the whole Winrose scandal. And as you know, worked closely with the late Paulette Wilson uh, around exposing the scandal, fighting for the rights of the Winrose generation. And, one, and the Winrose scandal was a reminder definitely for black people, about the fragility of our status in Britain and the whole notion of Britishness. Were we really British? Did they really want us here? Um, the, Grenfell, the Grenfell situation with further reinforced that beforehand and the whole conversation around Brexit, around that raised this whole debate of who's, who's British and who's not. And I just felt it was important to relaunch the campaign, run that intervention to say, that we are British, this is our home, and we ain't going nowhere again. I felt this was really, really important uh, to, do, to, to do that. Also, um, there's been more research work done over the last 15, 16 years on black historical figures. Um, work done by a whole range of academics and writers who I've worked closely with, like David Olusugu, who's a good friend of mine who wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, he, you know, his TV series and programs. There's Miranda Kaufman, who's done a lot of work on Black Jews. There's been, there have been loads of books written and research done, uh, which have exposed, which we've, it's been a good opportunity to reassess Black historical achievement in Britain. So I think that was quite, that was quite important for the campaign to reflect some of that new research work as well. Uh, also, um, there's a whole new school population. So when I did the campaign, as I think, um, as Will said, you know, people, if you talk about Great, Great Britain, people know, what, what we're talking about Great Britain. Never heard that programme before. Um, but there's a whole new school population, there's a whole new generation. I mean, I, I was just looking, if I look at my family uh, uh, in Wolverhampton, 17 years ago, um, you know, my nieces were still, were, my niece uh, was probably still at junior school or something in, in secondary school. They probably weren't aware of the campaign. Well, she probably did because I probably nagging her about it anyway, being her uncle. But anyway, you know what I mean? Um, but there's a whole new generation uh, of people uh, to, to educate and inform. A couple of years ago, I met a young guy um, and he said, he said, I can remember that your campaign, Patrick, because when I was at primary school, we downloaded everything off, the, off your website and we plastered it in the school walls. And that's the first time I knew there were so many black people that had achieved. Um, so you don't realize, um, and I think that applies to all of us online, whatever work that you do at the university or what, whatever you do in society, you don't know the impact on how you influence people until years later. You just don't know that. No one's going to come to you. It, 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 you know, that's what happens. So, so I realised that it's important to do the campaign because there's a new school population, black and white children, and they need to know this history. So um, that's why I decided to launch the campaign again. But luckily for me at the time, uh, I got approached by uh, publishers, Robinsons, which is part of Little Brown Books, which is part of the uh, Hasha Empire. And they said, would you, write, would you like to write a book on uh, based around 100 Black Britons? And I said, yeah, fantastic. So I was contacting my colleague, Angelina. I said, let's get back together again. Let's try and work on this in terms of the campaign and the book. So what we did was to do a campaign and also to write a book at the same time. Uh, no easy feat, especially in the last few months with COVID-19 and uh, uh, particularly my colleague Angelina who'd done a lot of research work, could go to the British Library and you know and stuff like that. So, but we did it, we did, we did it and we did it. Um, so what we did, how we, we put, uh, launched a brand new website 
um, for people to do nom their nominations. We set up and revised some new criteria of what was Great Black Britain, and we, invi and we invited people, the public, to nominate on the website. We also had a number of events where people could write postcards and, sh and share who this should be. And we actually had over a thousand nominations of people uh, from the public as well. Plus, uh, so I put together a panel of people representing the arts, business, sports, culture, literature, uh, public life, healthcare, just to help me and my co-author to um, do the long listing from a, we had about 1200 names down to, we built it down to about 200, 250. And then me and uh, Angelina did the final shortlist for people to be included in the final list, which then formed the basis of the people that we profiled um, in the book as well. And it was, you know, so, um, and also at the same time, we launched a schools competition and the schools competition, which is still running, on, and the details are on the 100 Great Black Britons .co.uk website and whole idea of that school competition from preschool up to uh, people at university uh, undergrads um, to to research write do uh, make videos music anything at all based on Black British history uh, as well um, and also we have a teachers competition which has been sponsored by the trade union NEU so for, for the best lesson plans and uh, and information that they use for less, for teaching Black British history as well. Um, so um, one of the prizes, one of the top prizes, are uh, are negotiated. There's, a, there's next year there's going to be a major movie, uh, a Hollywood movie about the life of Mary Seacole. And uh, I got to know, I got I met the executive producer, American guy, came over is over in Britain a few months ago, and I convinced him to donate a prize. So he's going to donate some laptops, but the main prize. Uh, is um, for young people to go on the film set, subject to COVID and all that kind of stuff, um, to meet the cast and to also have an experience of seeing how you edit a, a film, a, um, a Hollywood film. So that's one of the main prizes. All the details are on the website. We are still looking for sponsors for some of the key stage two, key stage three. So if the university wants to put the hand in the pocket and, you know, it's not gonna cost that much, only a couple hundred quid. It'd be good for branding and marketing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it will? It, it might be. We might. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a look into that. Okay. You. So um, anyway, so we've got. Yeah. You know, so we're doing that as well. So the closing dates in December. So far, we have received over eight hundred entries. The best one I've seen so far is a five-year-old for the preschool category. I think she was probably forced by her parents to read a script about who's a favorite Great Black Britain. But that's fantastic. More the merrier. Um. So some of the people that we've featured in the book, um, uh, which is different from the campaign that we did 17 years ago, of, we've still got some people, historical figures like Mary Seacole. We still have the abolitionist Elode Equiano, Sancho. Um, we've got Harold Moody, who founded the League of Nations in 1931, uh, one of the very first civil rights organisations of Britain in the interwar years, fighting the issues around the colour bar and discrimination in the 1930s. Um, we've got um, some new individuals um, featured in the book, such as um, 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 Agri Burke, who one of the one of the very first black psychiatrists to be appointed in the NHS in the early seventies, and actually in many ways, um, um, ACCI in Wolverhampton, which it was before that it was called uh, the D WRP. He actually spoke at a number of he actually that inspired a lot of those guys because he used to come to Wolverhampton in the 80s talking about the issues around uh, overrepresentation in the mental health system. And that, I think that played a key role in inspiring the creation of WRP uh, and a now ACCI as well. So uh, Agri's um, featured in the book. We've also got um, Lewis Hamilton's in the book. And um, if, I, if we did the book five years ago, I wasn't quite sure if he would be in there, but I think over the last few years, he's like really used his status as now the official number one racing driver all time, um, talking about Black Lives Matter and a whole range of other issues he's been raising around the diversity of, the, of, of Formula One. Uh, in the book, we've got a whole range of activists and campaigners. We've got Stafford Scott, uh, who's done a lot, of work, a lot of work on Stop and Search. We've featured Marcia Rigg, who's done a lot of work around 
on the results of the murder of her brother um, in Brixton Police Station has played a key role in influencing the change in the mental health services over the last 10, 15 years. Um, we've featured um, uh, Bernd, Bernd in Everisto, you know, award-winning writer, um, John O'Confer, director, oh, but also we've also featured like Coxon, you know, respected sound guy to recognize his contribution to base culture and Britain over the last 50 years. So um, Dennis Bavel, we've featured him as well. Um, so, uh, you know, basically the grandfather of Lover's Rock, basically. So we've, we've featured a whole range of people from different sectors and from healthcare to business, um, et cetera, to reflect that it's a barometer of how Britain is um, compared to 17 years ago uh, as well. So, uh, I mean, the other thing just to add finally uh, is um, that in the context of Black Lives Matter, um, um, the book, I suppose, is a reminder of that Black Lives do matter, the past, the present uh, and the future as well. And I hope that the book will inspire people. So far, the book's doing very well. We've sold, since the book came out in September, uh, mid uh, 24th of September, and we've sold over 5,000 copies since September, but only five weeks. It's amazing. Uh, it's, and the reason why I think people are buying the book um, is not simply, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a good biographical reference. It's like there on your bookshelf as a, as, a, as a source for reference. But a lot of people are buying the book um, because um, they can relate to someone in the book based on their experiences. Uh, black or white, people, people have been buying the book relating to that. And also um, it's almost like, it's, it's actually more than just a book. I think people, it's about us, it's making a statement that we're black, we're British, this is our home and you have to accept it. You know, this is our home and we, and but a sense of belonging is really, really critical. I mean, I've, my background, I've worked in health and social care for many years and belonging and identity is really critical because if you don't have that belonging and identity, it means that it has an impact on your mental health and your well-being. I think this is really, really important. Black Lives Matter reasserts Black Lives Matter. We are human. We are. We need to be respected. We need to be valued. You know, uh, in the workplace, in the highway, etc. And this is really, really important as well. So I'm, I'll stop there. I'm happy to have a conversation with you. Any questions or any comments or etc. Right. So I think the way we've set this up is that if you'd like to ask a question, just you post it in the Q&A um, and then I can ask it on behalf of, uh, of, your, of you. So if you, I think you can put it down as anonymous if you want it to be anonymous, but uh, like I'm sure there's no reason to do that. But uh, the first question we have is from Elizabeth Bull, who asks, um, oh, about the Mary Seacole film, uh, why use American producers um, when we have homegrown Steve McQueen? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, you know, that's a big issue, isn't it? I mean, the person I met is, is a race in green, and it's an American guy who is part of linked to the Hollywood fraternity. And I asked him, I asked him out of interest, why are you, doing, why are you making the movie? And he was handed the script from another Hollywood writer who'd written the script. Um, and that's how, and, and he was interested in that. So, but yes, I mean, you know, there is a whole, I mean, in the book actually, by the way, we've actually featured about four, five uh, film directors, black men and women, uh, Amar Sante, Horace Ove, um, John O'Confra, of Steve McQueen, obviously, and uh, Mendevich Shabazz. Uh, and they've all made fantastic films and um, that might inspire hopefully other people as well, but you're quite right, there's always, there's always that deficit. Um, why is it that, you know, and that applies not just to film directors, but in for actors, why is it that all our top black British actors have to go to America and play a half parts of African-Americans? And it's mean, got, you know, so Dave Oluwu, fantastic portrayal of Martin Luther King and Selma. Um, but why he could easily be Harold Moody in Peckham in 1930s about his struggles around racial discrimination. So I think I'm hoping the book might. I said to, I did say to Billy, he's the, the guy from Racial Green making the Mary Sickle movie, because um, he's got he's got a copy of the book. I said I hope that there'll be other people will look at that book, and so we need to have more stories of some of these black heroes and sheroes uh, about their contribution. No, I, I agree, and I think it's worth uh, 
whilst you just wait for further questions to come in, it might be just be worth just talking about the issue we had um, during, you know, during the early stages of pandemic, where the, you know, you're mentioning Mary Seacole, you know, the government set up all the Nightingale Hospital. Oh, yes. And was asked, you know, how, well, hang on, you know, why not at least say maybe the one in Birmingham? Could that not be a Mary Seeker hospital? And they went, no. Yeah, precisely. They went, no. I mean, and I, I, I mean, the petition I did, uh, 15,000 people signed that petition. And yeah, we didn't get the Mary Seeker hospital and NC. In a funny way, I'm glad, Will, it, we didn't. You know why? It's not been used. Yeah, it's true. It's not been used. But what happened, um, uh, NHS Trust uh, in Surrey, Surrey Heath NHS Trust, I'm speaking at their Black History event later on this week, um, they were going to have the first COVID re rehab hospital and they decided to call it Mary Seacole. So that was in June and that's really fantastic. So in many ways, that's probably even better because that's going to be there for at least a couple of years anyway, as the pandemic kind of enrages. Um, but yeah, but, but it, it, yeah, it, yeah, it required to do a campaign again to remind people that Florence, that Mary Seacole is just as important as Florence Nightingale. And, you know, so that's the issue. We have to keep on reminding people all the time. When will it be a time that you don't have to remind people? People do their homework, do their research work, make analysis, say, let's do this. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, again, if anybody has any questions, please pop, pop them into the chat and we'll ask them. Oh, we'll be having a vote. This is from Rob uh, Maris. Oh, Rob, uh, hi, Rob. How are you, uh, sir, Squire? Dif different choices given the talent and the, achie and the achievements. Uh, Paul Boateng was the first UK's first black cabinet minister. Uh, why this slightly surprising omission? Because Paul Boateng was in the first campaign. Um, he was included in the campaign in 2004, along with other people, uh, like Lord Homer Oosley's. I mean, we've just updated the campaign to reflect 17 years on new people in, in politics. So for example, um, Dawn Butler's in there um, for the first time um, and other people's including there, but Paul Botan's still a great Black Britain, um, you know, uh, and other people that were featured uh, in the original mm -hmm. campaign. But with, like I said for the book is like a barometer of where we are now in 2020 in terms of what the changes basically. I mean, uh, Una, King, Una, Una King was in the original campaign. I mean, she's not in this one. We're just reflecting the times of new faces, basically. And just a follow-up question to that. And as I said, please, anybody further um, uh, questions, just put them in the Q&A. Um, how, what have you made of the recent growth of um, uh, black and to a lesser extent, black and Asian Tories, particularly obviously focusing on black Tories? Because, you know, it was quite striking. I think it was last week, where the House of Commons had their debate on Black History Month. Sure, yes. And actually, it was the first time, really, where both the Tory side, the Tory contributions and the Labour contributions were from primarily from people you know, of, uh, of Black heritage, and yet the, the partisan divide was still there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's even more so today if you hear the comments from James Cleverly. Uh, I mean, I, I was on Radio 5 Live a couple of weeks ago, and I was interviewed and they said, um, the journalist said to me, <clears throat> Patrick, great book. Uh, I noticed that you, in your book, you've got uh, Diane Abbott, um, Dave Lammy, Dawn Butler. Is this a Labour book? And, you know, where are the Conservative MPs in the book? So I said, well, no, that's not true. We've got Lib Dems in the book. We've got cross benches in the book. And um, one of the criteria that we use um, to be in this, this cut of 100 Black Britons was how have you used your privilege as a black person? It's not good enough to be the first of. That's what we, that's what we did 17 years ago. Because 17 years ago, we were trying to make the case to the BBC and to, uh, and to others that we do exist and we're here. So the, it was, that was a campaign. 17 years on, the focus was now, how have you used your privilege for the community? And that's why there's no black, Tory MPs in the book because they've not done that. If they've done that, they'll be in the book. If this was in America, even the most ardent Republican, Black Republicans, some of them do stuff for the community still, and you know, but for some reason, that's not happening in the UK. So, you know, and that's a chance for, for the any Black Tories out there, do stuff for the community, and you're in the book. 
The um, do we have any other questions from any and from anybody? Oh, we've got another one coming in. Um, so this is from Councillor Sandra Samuels. Um, Sandra, hi there. So you've campaigned tirelessly for policy change within British legislation, health inequality, Windbush scandal, enslaved re uh, repatriation, and many more. Um, Patrick, thank you once again. What keeps you awake at night? What keeps me awake at night? God. Um, um, I don't know. I think some of those things keep me awake. Um, maybe I have too much coffee. Yeah, I had I drink too much coffee. That's why that keeps me away. No, seriously, it's hard on me. Uh, it's, it's I mean, Sandra. I mean, I've got, I have a lot of time and respect for you. You've worked tirelessly away in Wolverhampton, with not you know and you know the recognition you deserve and stuff like that. So, I, and it's probably the same thing that keeps you awake at night too. <laughs> I, I suspect, but I think it's you know I think it's about injustice. I mean, obviously, you know. Um, we're still we're trying to fight for better equality for all people uh, in the communities that we serve and where we live. I think that's really, really important. And if you're a campaigner or, or activist or politician, that's part of your motivation. You want to you want to make a difference in the community and do the right thing. You know, you, you know, we you know sometimes we choose these these provocations in life to make a difference. Yes, otherwise you could easily have a nine to five job. And just do the conventional stuff and forget about stuff. Uh, but a few of passions about social justice, um, that's part of it's part of, sadly it's part of the package when you do social justice work, that you are there all thinking about what you need to do all the time for the community. It's selfishly, like you do, Sandra. So respect for you and also for Rob as well, who just called um, as well. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? I think mean, just going back to the point about schools, I think that is an important, a really important issue. I mean, particularly, I just know, I mean, um, my, my, both my stepson's parents are, black, are, are first generation immigrants from Zimbabwe, my, son, my son's mixed race, and there's always a danger that, give, uh, that they can assume that, that the British, that white people are the British people. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you have conversations with my stepson and it will be, um, and he will like subconsciously do, you know, they're the British people and then they're the black people. And to try and get that message across, actually, you know, there's, you know, decades of the modern multiracial Britain contributions long before that as well by black people. It's just a really important message, a message to get across. And it's like, you know, it's, it's the, um, the point that, that, it's been, that can't be made enough, but like the armies that went to fight for Britain in the First World War look a lot more like today's Britain than a Britain of 1914 because of how much Britain relied on uh, soldiers from you know, Asia, Africa, mm -hmm. the Caribbean. And so I think it's a great uh, campaign. And I think it's, it's about, it's what sometimes when you, you know, we had the whole statue discussions over the summer, a lot of the emphasis was on what people are being pulled down and that made people defensive, but actually, Often it's not even about that. It's like, well, what about the people we should be celebrating? There's a, there are a lot of objectionable people that have statues in this country. There's mm. also just a lot of mediocre people that people have forgotten why they have a statue. And actually, there are a lot of better people that we could, as a society, celebrate. And I think this is what this campaign uh, puts the uh, emphasis on. Uh, we have another question here. Um, how long did it take to write the book? Okay, so in terms of... Um... We'll just add to that point you just add will it's interesting because um as a result of the book there's been and also the whole stuff on black lives matter there's now a conversation uh, about more statues memorials of the diversity of areas i know that's a number of local authorities around the country are doing reviews of memorials and statues connected with, not just with slave trade but just generally and see what deficits there are and I don't know if that's happening in Wolverhampton. Either is Wolverhampton Council doing a review uh, as well? And and I think they should be seriously thinking about having more uh, statues in the public realm reflecting um, particularly black contribution. I mean, currently, apart from the blue plaque of uh, Oliver Lysite at Heathtown Church, um, which some of us were involved in, in that. I mean, Rob and Sandra were there at the unveiling of that. Uh, a few years ago, how many other, there are no other monuments or statues in the public realm 
that celebrates the black contribution, particularly the Muslim generation in Wolverhampton. When I got to Wolverhampton, you walk around Wolverhampton, you wouldn't think that we contributed to Wolverhampton, but we did. So there has to be more visibility. So I do urge the council uh, and maybe maybe work in partnership with, with the university to do some kind of audit work and to, make, and to come up with some ideas of that. I know that we're involved, some of us are involved with a campaign to have a blue plaque for Paulette Wilson. And you know, I think that's important. And other memoria around that as well. So I think that's really important to have that because it gives a message to people in Wolverhampton that we are, we are here, we have contributed to Wolverhampton and this is part of our legacy. I think that's really, 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 really critical. I mean, I know currently at Wolverhampton Art Gallery, they've got the BME project and they've got the oral histories there. And we had a kind of launch event online recently. I spoke up last week. Uh, with, with Frank and others involved in that, uh, and Delva. And I think um, one of the points I made in that conversation is we need to update that BME project, have some capture more oral histories, again, because there's other Windrush people who some have passed on, but some of them are still alive. And we need to capture those stories for prosperity's sake. Um, I think that's, I make it into a book. We, is there a book about the black contribution of people in Wolverhampton? There isn't one. You go into, into Waterstones in Wolverhampton, I've been there quite a few times. You go into the local history section. You'd be lucky you, if you look in those local history books. You might be lucky to see one picture of a black or Asian person in there, just about. So we need to have, you know, maybe this is the role of, of the university to try and commission, get resources or funding, so we can have a book celebrating the black contribution of Wolverhampton. I mean, I've done it at a national level um, with hundred great black Britons, but I'm sure we could do the same thing uh, in Wolverhampton. That's just my kind of there oh, sorry so back to the question what was the question sorry about that i uh, had no um the, the question was how long did it take to write the book and that's oh, so in terms of writing the book um it's uh, between me and angelina angelina did most of the, the, the writing because i was doing other projects and stuff like that but in total um it took us probably about 16 months and it's really interesting because the, the last the last few months was really hard work because of covid i mean the impact of covid19 on our mental health and well-being it just slows you down, doesn't it? You get, you know, you get slowed down, uncertainty. You know, you know, I had a bereavement in my family, round, round, lost my brother-in-law. It all has had an impact on, on, and uh, as on, on, on all of us uh, as well. But we, you know, but the publisher said that we could do this. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad because we could have easily delayed it and said, well, we'll finish it off for next year, and then we had Black Lives Matter. So it's interesting as we got the book done. We had a whole Black Lives Matter rally and the murder of George Floyd. And so in many ways, that's probably one of the reasons why the book is doing so well, because it's captured a sense of reality and the experience at the same time, basically. Yeah, no, I agree. Like it does feel an incredibly timely book. I'm even more so than usual, um, due to due to the, the things I think we've all been discussing. Um, do we have any other questions for Patrick? I don't, well, to see if anybody has any further questions, I suppose the obvious question to ask you is, is um, and we, we, we look primarily at the people you've added into the book, for, uh, into the top 100 um, this year. Uh, is there like a particular favourite that, you know, that kind of discovery and researching that you think is a particularly yeah. interesting I mean, example to highlight? Yeah. I mean, there's quite a few people which I do admire in the book, um, you know, um, so... One of them in particular is the late Bernard Grant MP. I'm currently the vice chair of the Bernard Grant Archives Trust. We actually preserve the archives of Bernard Grant Trust, of Bernard Grant. His archives are actually kept at the Bishop Gibbs Institute um, in, uh, in London. And if you, and it's an extensive archives. It covers his entire life, his work as a trade unionist, his work as a councillor and leader, uh, of Harringay Council, one of the very first black leaders of the local authority in Britain. And obviously his extensive work as an MP um, till his time of death, um, nearly, what, 20 years ago now. And uh, and in the archives, there's, there's a whole range of stuff around, obviously stuff around Broadwood Farm because of the whole stuff around Keith Blakelock and the uprisings and what happened there. There's a whole range of stuff about his work around reparations movement. There's a whole range of work 
about his work internationally in the Caribbean, in Africa, and also the work he was doing in Europe. He was doing a lot of work in Europe, working, you know, trying to unite black and brown people across Europe, uh, and you know, during the time of Maastricht uh, as well. It did an extensive amount of work. Um, he went to travel, he went to America quite a lot. He had developed links with the the the, um, the, the black caucus of basically Republican and Democrat politicians who work, you work together. We don't have that in Britain. We don't have a caucus of, uh, in America where you have Conservative and Labour and Lib Dem MPs uh, working together around black issues. You have that in America, basically. Uh, so he was work, he was he was linked into that. And obviously he's got a whole range of memorabilia around all his campaigns he did, being elected as a councillor uh, and an MP. So it's extensive archives. We've been able to get funding from um, HLF and other funding sources, and we've developed educational resource packs and materials using his experiences, but also the experiences of other people in that period of the 80s and 90s, around activism, around campaigning uh, as well. So he's definitely one of my favourites, yeah. Um, we, we have a, another question. I mean, actually, before I go into your question, it is worth saying, I, um, it's incredible to believe just how much genuine fear there were in parts of the right-wing press when Bernie Grant and the other uh, first Black and Asian MPs were elected in 1987. You know, there was talk of, you now would there be another uh, fourth party, which was a reference, uh, yeah. sorry, third party, which was a reference to the, the Irish nationalists in the Victorian Parliament. Like, there was genuine fear. And it is incredible to think that that was the kind of position that uh, the perspective that the mainstream society looked on black uh, black and Asian people trying to be you know you know advocates for themselves for their communities you know just in you know interacting with the democratic process and as a, as any other Britain would do not that long ago you know at 1987 isn't that long ago at all no no you, you you're quite right and uh, I mean that's still ongoing I mean we still have issues of not having enough representation of a black and other nationalist communities in the parliament. I mean, the parliament's a bit more, is more diverse now than ever, but I think there's still more work that needs to be done um, around representation. And in a place like Wolverhampton, um, you know, there's, hard, there's, there's still not enough representation of, of black people's councillors. I mean, there's hardly any black male councillors in Wolverhampton, it's ridiculous. In 2020, not a black male person representing uh, a, a political party, particularly Labour, as a, as a representative. I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong here. I'm not quite sure what's happening, but more work needs to be done. Definitely more than the work needs to be done on that front. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the other question, again, from Councillor Samuels. We are campaigning to have a book in every school within London. What more can we do to influence this in the cities? Uh, in the city of Wolverhampton's education system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when are you in Wolverhampton again, Patrick? <laughs> My 91 year old father and I need our book signing. <laughs> uh, so Lambeth Council, um, about a week ago, they acquired 150 copies of the book. And they invited me and a co-author, went out to Brixton Town Hall, for a kind of uh, for a photo opportunity, that book is going. The book is going to every single primary school and secondary school, and every single library in Lambeth. So, and it doesn't cost that much basically because you get a, you still get a trade discount if you buy it in bulk. It, it's only a couple of thousand pounds if you work it out. So, maybe Sandra, speak to your speak to leader of the council. You can do this, and it it, it would have a massive impact. That book would be in every single school. In Wolverhampton. I don't know how many schools there are um, in Wolverhampton in terms of primary school and secondary schools and stuff like that. Um, but that would be fantastic. For a couple of thousand quid, you can get that book in every single school. And, that, and they would give a, a real statement um, to not just to for schools and the children, but to Wolverhampton that, that it's serious about black history, it's serious about inclusion, etc. The campaign, um, which Sandra touched on, uh, is been run by Yvonne Davis. She's a former head teacher in Hertfordshire. She's just recently retired. She's actually from Wolverhampton herself, believe it or not. Um, um, and she left Wolverhampton, you know, a long time ago. But she has her roots in Wolverhampton, so there must be something about Wolverhampton 
jeans or blood on or something like that. Uh, but anyway, she's launched this campaign um, to to raise money through GoFundMe that the book should be in every second every secondary every secondary school in Britain. There are about eight thousand secondary schools, including independents and pupil referral units. So far, in the last couple of weeks, she's raised over ten thousand uh, pounds, and the first batch of books. That she's raised is going into schools as we speak. Schools can go onto the 100 Great Blackburn website. You can, schools can register and complete a form, and they'll be in a waiting list and they'll get a copy of the book. Um, if we can raise enough money, hopefully all schools will have that. But it'd be great if local authorities could also do the same thing and buy books and distribute it for all the schools uh, in, the, in that area. No, I think that'd be great. I mean, I I've, I've got mine on Kindle, which I'm uh, work, working my way through, and it, it is a great read. And I, and I said, it's a really important book. I think we have a couple of t uh, a time for maybe one more question, if anybody has one. Otherwise, I will thank Patrick. Going once. I think that is time. So, but again, big thank you again, Patrick. It's always yeah. great to have you coming to talk to us. I'm glad the book is going well um, so far, and I'm sure it will keep going well. Um, as, as, as the uh, campaign gathers momentum. Um, but thank you again, Patrick. Do you have any closing uh, remarks for oh, us? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the question Sandra asked me, like, when I'm going to come to Wolverhampton, well, it depends on this tier system, isn't it? Yeah. You know, basically. Um, I might, I'd love to come to Wolverhampton, especially at Christmas, spend Christmas with my family. But I don't know if we can even do that because of the current situation that we have around COVID policy and stuff like that. So I don't know. Um, I don't know, unless you, unless you come down to London, Sandra, bring your dad down. And I'm sure we'll, we'll connect I'm somewhere, don't worry, we'll some, I'm sure we can work out something. So on that note, I've just a couple of housekeeping notes for me. T tomorrow, tomorrow we have a event on at 3 p.m., which is a film screening of a, a, a moment of local Black British history, which also reaches into the Caribbean which is of Brian Lara's uh, uh, Getting 501 in Warwickshire, for Warwickshire over at Edgebaston. There's a new film being produced by a local filmmaker that's actually aired, you know, it's had film screenings in here, it's had film screenings over in uh, Lara's uh, native Trinidad and Tobago, as well their, their film festival. So we're, we're airing that at 3 p.m., a special uh, virtual film screening for anybody who's free. And then at 7.30, we have a special Zoom concert as well. Um, so you can see the links on our on, on the university's website. Um, but thank you again, Patrick, and thank you again to everybody uh, who's been been on the call. It's been a it's been a pleasure spending the hour talking about a uh, hundred great greatest Black Britons. Thank you again, Patrick. Okay, and thank you very much for your support, everyone. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much.